It's Tox from CritsHappen.com. Thanks for watching and welcome back. We're in the game room and we have another critical review for you, this time about a game that I've probably been just as excited to bring to you as you've been to check it out. It's from the Arcane Wonders team and it's called Mage Wars, the customizable strategy game of dueling mages. Now, let's be very fair. Dueling mages is not something new. In fact, it's the baseline for a majority of games that are out there. So what does this game do that's different? What does it do that's unique? What does it do that's revolutionary that sets it apart? In fact, does it do any of that or is it just another game of dueling mages? Well, there's been a lot of buzz about this game. My first experience hands-on with it was at Gen Con 2012 this year where I actually got to meet the leaders of the team, Brian and Benjamin Pope, who are our father and son team at Arcane Wonders. These guys have spent the better part of the last five years driving to build this to be the best game possible. Their whole key thing is they want to make sure when people are done playing this game, they had the best experience possible and they walk away feeling, I was really that mage. I was the person in that game fighting and casting these spells and doing all these cool things. And win, lose, or draw, man, I'm ready to get back in that arena. That's something that really stuck out to me. I had the chance to talk to them at Gen Con, had a wonderful time talking about industry, talking about game development, game design, and most importantly, about Mage Wars. So while it's taken five years to get to this point, I should shut up and show you the game. Let's get right into it. Now, Mage Wars is a customizable strategy game that primarily uses cards and a small amount of dice where you take a role of a powerful mage, you enter the arena to combat another mage, and in traditional Thunderdome style, the last man standing wins, or the last woman standing wins. Now before you play the game of Mage Wars, there's a lot to get into around customizing and get building your strategy. The first thing is talking about these two spell books. These both come with the game, aside from the 300 plus cards. And what you're gonna do is you're actually going to choose a mage and in this case this book has the warlock now each mage has a card that's going to represent their creature on the board and then a actual card to show all of their stats so just running through real quickly this shows the amount of points I can build when building my spell book and each spell is worth different points there are 38 points for my health zero natural defense and I channel nine mana we'll get into each of that in a second You'll see here that this guy is trained in the dark and fire schools and holy spells cost triple during spellbook creation. So one of the nice things about this is that while for most parts classes and races and some games will eliminate the use of spells totally, I can use a holy spell if I want to with my warlock and I can immediately put that in my book. However, it's going to cost me triple the points. Now the other thing is there's additional abilities on here. You'll notice he has the Blood Reaper ability, which we won't get into too much. He has Battle Skill, which gives him plus one melee trait, and he has a quick melee attack that does three dice. Let me say that again, a quick melee attack that does three dice. This is one of the things that I personally really, really like about Mage Wars. Everything that looks like it is, is what it is. I don't know if that's a really the best way to say it. How about this? Logic runs deep in Mage Wars. If you think something does something, it usually does. It's very straightforward in terms of if magic were real, this is what it would be like. Let me show you the other one real quick that we have built. This is the Beastmaster. This is my personal favorite. I really enjoy this guy because he's all about summoning creatures. He also has 120 points when building his spell book. He has 36 health instead of 38, no defense naturally, and nine channeling mana as well. He's trained in nature schools and fire spells cost triple during spell book creation. One nice thing is he does have pet. Pet is a huge thing inside of the game because it allows him to turn one of the creatures he has into his pet. So let's take a second and before we, we look at actual gameplay, let's show you a little bit about the setup after you've built a spell book. 
Now, Mage Wars is a customizable game with over 300 cards available to you to create your spell books. Your spell books are actual 4x4 binders that come with the game. There's two of them. There's one that looks like a leather bound look, and then there's another one that has more of a kind of a darker look with, um, you know, kind of a gothic kind of style to it. They're really nice because the spaces that they give you to put your cards in here are big enough to actually sleeve the cards and put the cards in there. Now I have not sleeved mine yet, but this gives you a little bit of an idea as to some of the cards that you can put in here. I'm not gonna go through every card, but the nice thing is that while this may be your first time to a game like this, there are starting decks, quote unquote, or starting spell books that are in the rule book that they suggest to build to start a few of your games. So what you actually do is you put together from points and by that I mean like this guy for example is a beast master and has 120 points when creating his spell book. You would put together the best spell book that you can based on how you want to play. And this is a very nice thing about it. When they talk custom customizable, they really do mean customizable. So after I've built my spell book from all my spells, the first thing I'm gonna do in a game is I'm gonna bring out my, my character. And you'll see that this is just purely a simple card that represents my Beastmaster. Now I would start in one corner of the arena and my opponent would start in the other corner of the arena. So there's a little bit of maneuvering before you actually get into deep action. And then this card that gives me all of my abilities, like pet and quick summoning and battle skill, is going to stay in front of me and be able to be referenced during gameplay. Now additionally, each player has a mage status board, which is going to keep track of the amount of mana you channel, it's going to keep track of your current mana supply, the damage you've taken, and your health total overall. So you'll see that the Beastmaster starts with 36 health. So we put a red marker on the 36. You count damage up because there are spells that will increase your life total as well. So basically once these two meet, game over and you're out of the arena. Once you've put your spell books together, it's then time to step into the arena, which is this gigantic board that's made up of 12 zones. These zones are where all the action takes place, and some, like these, are adjacent. Anything attached side by side is adjacent. Anything that's diagonal is not adjacent. So if I have the ability with a Beastmaster to hit somebody with an attack one zone away, I can hit them in this zone, or I can hit them in this zone. If I can hit two zones away, then I can hit them in this zone because I can count one and two. Now there is line of sight issues. There are walls that can be summoned and be placed like this in between two different locations and some of them will block line of sight and some of them will actually damage things. Action markers, which each mage starts the game with 10, are a big part of the game. Starting the game, the mages will start with one action marker to represent their main one and they get a special quick cast action marker as well. Whenever these are face up, you know that they have an action that they can take. Whenever they are face down, you know that they've taken their action. So when there gets to be a lot of, of creatures out on the board, it's really easy to tell who is left to act. When the gameplay starts and you alternate taking turns, what happens is you would take an action with one of your creatures and your mage counts as a creature. So once I take my action with, let's say, my mage, it would then be my opponent's turn to take an action with one of his creatures. At the beginning of the game, you'll roll for initiative, but after that, the initiative button gets passed back and forth. So it's a constant ebb and flow back and forth. Now, on my starting turn, I can look in my spell book and I can pick out any cards that I want. Let me say that again. I can look through my spell book and pick out any two cards that I want. This is the most unique mechanic when it comes to Mage Wars. You'll notice in most of these cards there's a mana cost in the upper left. It'll then tell you if it's a quick action or a full action. It'll tell you how far away the range is and what the actual target is. So like this mana flower will target a zone. This regrowth belt will target the mage itself. And then there's creatures and there's spells throughout as well. You'll see here some of the walls that you could look at as well. Wall of Thorns, for example, from the Beastmaster's deck. And you'll see that there's creatures as well. And all the creatures have um, an armor rating, a health rating, usually some type of ability, and then either a quick or a full action in terms of attacking. But 
For instance, I start the game with 10 mana. I channel 9, so I start off on my first turn with 19. That means if I want to go and on turn one go get this red claw guy, which is 16 mana, he has three armor and 12 health and he attacks for five dice and he's legendary and has all this cool stuff to do, I can go do it. I don't have to wait and hope that I top deck. I don't have to wait and hope that I can find that deck through other cards to go find, you know, get that spell I need. This is probably the coolest thing to me because I can't count the number of times I have played other games that involve this genre of battling mages and I know that my mage knows how to heal. I just don't have the card in hand. Well, all I have to do is go find the heal. Here's minor heal, for example and I can pull it out of my spell book and get ready to use it on turn one, which hopefully I wouldn't need to. But later in the game when I'm taking damage, if I want to, I can go get that healing card. So it's absolutely phenomenal in terms of accessibility. Now this makes Mage Wars extremely strategic because you could build the best spell book that you could ever think of, but you're still gonna have to adapt to what your opponent throws at you in the game and not just have the best cards, but know when to use the cards that you have to make the biggest impact. Now let me give you an example. Um, before I show you a combo, I'll show you a basic card. This is Chain Lightning. Now again, when you do things in Mage Wars, they just seem to make sense. So this costs 12 mana, it's a full action, it's a zero to one range, and it can target a creature or a conjuration. This also is a ranged attack that does an electrical damage for five dice. And on a D12, which is a condition roll, on a five to seven, the target is dazed, and on an eight plus, they're stunned. So what does Chain Lightning do? Well, very simple. Each time Chain Lightning damages a target, it may attack another target. That target must be in line of sight of the last target and may be up to one zone away from that target. Each successive attack rolls one fewer attack dice and subtracts one more from the effect die roll. Chain Lightning can't attack the same target twice. Now, this is ridiculously cool because it's not a Chain Lightning spell that just does 3-2-1. It's not a Chain Lightning spell that hits two targets and then fizzles away. If you can chain this between one, two, three, four, five targets, you can keep doing that. And not only that, you'll notice in the text, it's just target. It doesn't have to be an opponent. There are different effects in the game that will cause creatures to become asleep or stunned or things like that. And the next time they take damage, they'll wake up. So I could effectively use something like Chain Lightning to attack an opponent's three creatures, but at the very end, hit one of mine, wake them up and get them out of a condition. It's absolutely phenomenal in terms of strategic depth that way. Now here's another great example. Now this is probably my favorite card in the game right now. It's Highland Unicorn. It costs 13 mana. It's a full action, zero, zero into zone because it's a creature that's gonna come out. It has two armor and it has nine health and on a quick action can melee attack for three dice. It also has Regenerate 2, which at the beginning of each turn during the ready stage, you're gonna add, or, uh, add two health back to their life. And, or add to, to their health total. And then he has charge plus two, which means that if he's in this zone and I move up here to attack, then I'm going to add two dice to my attack. So I would go from three dice to five dice for the attack. Now, additionally, he says all friendly living creatures in the same zone as Highland Unicorn gain regenerate plus one trait. Now, that's a good card on its own. It's even more deadly with this with Force Push. Force Push only costs three mana. It can be used as a quick cast action from your mage. It's a zero to two range and it targets a creature. Target creature is pushed one zone in the direction of your choice. If the target is pushed through a wall with the passage attack trait, it must pay an additional three mana, or you must pay an additional three mana. There, this has no effect on unmovable creatures. Well, why is this good? Well, let me tell you why this is good. Let's say my mage is right here. Let's say my unicorn is right here. And let's say that my uh, opponent has a creature. Bear with me, I know it says chain lightning. But let's say there's a creature right here. I could use force push 
to, or I'm sorry, let's say my creature is right here. This is this is the setup. I could use force push to push the opponent's creature this way. I could then use the Highland Unicorn to charge and move in to attack and gain the bonus. So even though we both start in the same zone, I could move him away with force push and then move and attack with the Unicorn and hit with the five dice for the attack. And then anyone else in this zone is going to get the additional regenerate plus one trait. So again, depending on where you've moved everyone, big strategic depth just from two different cards right here. Now each creature when they're summoned is also going to get one of these action markers. And when they use them, they move flip them over just like everything else. So again, it's really easy and very simple to see all the different things that are happening in gameplay. Now, another nice thing about the mage status board, there's a round summary, and it shows you the two stages, the ready stage and the action stage. And it shows you each of the things that you do. The first thing in the ready stage is you change initiative. So the first round, uh, first turn of the game, people will roll the d12 for initiative, and whoever has the highest will go first, and then from there it flip-flops back and forth. Then you will reset all of your tokens, so anything that you have on the flip side will reset back to the white side, so you know that everyone can take actions. You'll channel your mana, so you'll add whatever the amount of channel is to your total here on your mana supply. You'll do upkeep, so again, when we mentioned before, the unicorn who has regenerate 2 and has regenerate 1 trait for everyone in the same zone, th things like that will trigger during that time frame of upkeep. Then you get into planning, which is where you take the two cards out of your spell book, and then you get into deployment. Once everyone is deployed, you go into the action stage, and you have a quick cast phase, creature actions, and then a final quick cast phase. Now what that means is the quick cast phase is, while everyone in the game is allowed to utilize their action marker to take an action, the mages have the additional quick cast action marker which allows them to take a regular action with their action token and then a quick cast action with their quick cast token. This offers a lot of flexibility and a lot of devious planning. But it's nice that everything is laid out right there. And I'm not kidding you, I just explained the entire setup of each round. It is that logical and it is that easy. So while there's so much depth to this game, the way to learn this game is by sitting down, playing a few games, and realizing, wow, it really is that easy. Okay, so I want to show you an example of combat in the game. Now, we were talking before about um, the combination with the Highland Unicorn. I think this is a great way to show you. So the first thing I would end up doing is playing Force Push for three mana, and I would target my opponent's Dark Fane Hydra, and I would move him over here then my opponent could get to go and make an action because this is something that comes from my mage, okay? So let's presume that I use his quick cast for that since this is a quick cast action. So then my opponent could get to move. Let us presume that his Dark Fane Hydra had already acted and couldn't move or do anything else, so he was kind of stuck there. He takes his turn, does whatever action he's gonna do. Then on my turn, I activate my Highland Unicorn, I charge in, and I make an attack against the Hydra. So again, you'll notice it is a melee attack, so I have to be in the same zone. I get charge plus two, so I would roll three dice normally, and then I would roll two additional for charge. Now, the Hydra has an armor of one. What does that mean? Well, let's go ahead and roll, and we'll show you what would happen. All right, we rolled a bunch of starbursts with ones, a regular one with one, and a miss. What does all that mean? Well, before I tell you, let me show you the dice. There's, I think, nine dice that come total in the game. There's many times where we actually will roll more than nine dice. Um, but they have blanks for misses, one and two that has a starburst, which represents critical damage, and then a one and a two that are normal that represent normal damage. Now, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that normal damage can be blocked by armor. So this one gets blocked by this one armor. Critical damage cannot be blocked by armor. So this total attack would do three damage to the Dark Fane Hydra and take it from 15 down to 12 health. It's that simple in terms of attacking. If I were to have rolled all twos, let's say, that were regular, 
These would all be counted up, two, four, six, seven, and again, I would remove one damage from the armor, and he would be at two, four, six total damage taken. So it's very, very simple to figure out in terms of attacking. Now, the same thing happens coming backwards. If the Dark Fane Hydra were to attack me, he has four dice or three dice, depending on which attack he wants to use. He has a quick strike and he has a full attack as well. The quick rolls four dice and has the counter strike ability, and the full attack has uh, three dice and has triple strike. Well, think logically. What do you think counter strike does? Yes, it does that. It allows you to counter strike with it. And then triple strike, what does that do? Yes, you attack three times with it. It's that logical and that easy to figure out. There are a ton of keywords in this game. Just here you can see counter strike, triple strike, regenerate, slow, regenerate, charge. There's so many different things, but it all is logical. Regenerate two, I regenerate two health. Charge plus two, I get to attack with two more dice when I charge. It seems like a lot at first, but it's actually quite easy to pick up, and once you play a few games, it just becomes secondhand knowledge, which is one of the really nice things about Mage Wars. It's deeply strategic, but very easy to pick up. So that is Mage Wars in a very, very small nutshell. There is so much more to this game that we didn't show you. I'm actually going to take some time and show you one of the spell books after this. So after I'm done talking, if you want to turn off the channel, feel free to go ahead. But if you'd like to see a deeper look into one of the spell books, we're going to take a look at the Beastmaster spell book and show you some of the cards that are involved there. But what do I think? I'm just going to jump right into it. I cannot give this game a bigger crit than I am right now. This thing is a crit. It's one of the best five games I've played this whole year, and I've played a lot. It is highly strategic. It is tactical. There's so many choices when you're in combat. There's the strategies of do I just go right after the opponent's mage, or am I just going to get flooded if I do that with creatures? Or am I going to get blown up by the warlock and all of his curses and AoE spells? There's so many different things that are making this game just exciting to play. And to me, that's the most fun. I'll be very straightforward. My first game with this took quite a bit. It took us about two hours to demo our first game at Gen Con, but it was because we were trying to absorb and understand everything we could. That said, it is not a sit down, pick up, and get going. It's definitely something you're going to have to sit down, read a little bit, and understand how things interact. But again, everything interacts very logically, which is a very fun part of this game. It's something that you could look at any card and go, um, what is regenerate? Oh, okay, yeah, that's what that does. It's very, very logical to keep up with. There's tons of tokens in the game, so there's easy ways to mark and denote what is going on with each of the creatures in the game. But more than anything, these spell books, while it seems so simple of an idea, is revolutionary. The ability to know that I don't have to worry about top decking anything. The ability to know that I don't have to worry about building up to anything other than my mana supply to play cards is phenomenal. If there's a card that's going to get me out of a pinch that I'm in and I know I've got it in my deck, I can go get it. I, and it's so rewarding to know that and know that I can plan ahead, I can react during the game, and as long as I keep that strategic mindset of how to handle everything, I'm going to come out ahead. The nice thing about that is it also means it really comes down to the skill of the players playing against each other. We could sit down, you and I, in a game of Mage Wars with the two exact same spell books and probably never have the same game twice because there's so many different nuances that happen with moving your creatures around the arena, attacking, placing walls in different areas. I've probably played about 15 to 16 games of Mage Wars and I have yet with most of them being done with the Beastmaster, to feel like any of them are the same game. And that's a blast. The first thing I said to Patrick, the gentleman who actually did my demo at Gen Con with me, when I got done, I stood up and the first thing I said to him was, man, this is awesome. I won and I want to play again. And the person I was playing against said, yeah, I want to play again too. A game that makes you feel so excited about that moment, that, that kind of, as Corey Jones from Cryptozoic calls it, the live the dream moment, where everything comes together because of your strategy, your planning, and your well put together tactics is phenomenal. And this game delivers that. 
It is something that if you are a miniature game lover, and follow me on this, you're going to get that feeling of moving minis around the board with your cards. Now I know they're cards and it may not appeal to all mini gamers, but I did feel like I could put minis on these cards and that was what they would be moving around. I, I definitely felt like I was a mage. And the nice thing about this is whether you play the Warlock, the Priestess, the Wizard, the Beastmaster, they all play very, very differently. You can put very similar cards into the decks, but the strategies behind them, how they're invoked when you get into the arena, the creatures that work well with them in tandem, the traps that you can lay out on the arena as well, it definitely feels like totally different gameplay, whether you're playing the mage or the beast, or excuse me, the wizard or the beast master or any of the classes involved. Now additionally, there's already plans for expansions and there's already plans for more mage types, more creatures, more spells, more of everything, which just makes it that much more fun. But as I said in the beginning, this is a customizable strategy game. This is not a collectible strategy game. So the nice thing about it is when you buy this box, which only retails for $59.99, you get all of the cards, all 320 some odd cards that come in the game. So if you and I both go buy this, we have access to the same cards. There's no chasing, there's no eBaying, there's no nothing like that, which is beautiful. I enjoy knowing that especially a game like this that does have plans for organized play in friendly local game shops, I'm not going to be put in a position where I have to go off and chase down a bunch of other cards that somebody else may have access to easier than I do. So overall, definitely a crit. I highly suggest to check out Mage Wars when you can. We'll put links to their pages here below. They also have a Facebook page as well. But they're a great team of people behind this game, a lot of support from a great community, and overall, a wonderful and beautiful game that's going to provide a great experience for you and your friends playing this. Now, I will let you know as well, the game is normally built for two players, but you can play two-on-two -two in a team variant, which is a lot of fun as well. The organized play, as I understand it, is going to be a one-on-one -on -one type environment, but you never know what could happen. The best thing about this, though, is as it is, $59.99 for all of this is an incredible value, and to me, definitely worth checking out. I've easily bought Xbox games for the same price that were nowhere near as enjoyable and are collecting dust behind me near my big screen. So, at the end of the day, this is a crit game. Check out Mage Wars when you can. But until next time, feel free to leave your comments below on the YouTube channel. Let us know if you've already gotten Mage Wars, what you think about it, and all of the fun combinations that you've found already with the spells and the creatures. Until we see you next time, keep channeling that mana, keep rolling those dice, and we hope they're all crits. Okay, so first, thank you all for watching this critical review. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. We're going to take a, take a deeper look at the Beastmaster starting spell book. I want to be able to show everybody a lot of the cards that come in it, talk a little bit about the different types of cards that are involved with it, and just give you a deeper experience around the game. So taking a look, you have again the card that represents your mage, and then you have the card that shows you all of their abilities, all of their skill points, and everything involved with them. Now, again, the Beastmasters trained in nature schools, and fire spells cost triple when creating in their spell book. He has Quick Summoning, which says once per round, the Beastmaster may summon a level 1 animal creature spell as a quick spell. We'll show you what a level 1 looks like in a second. He also has one of the cooler abilities of all the mages, called Pet. When a friendly, non-legendary animal creature comes into play, you may make it your pet. Pay mana cost equal to the creature's level plus one. Then place the pet marker on it. Pet gain, the pet gains melee plus one, armor plus one, and life plus three. Whenever the pet is in the same zone as the Beastmaster, it gains an additional melee plus one. If the pet is destroyed, you may assign the marker again in the same manner when a new animal is summoned. So, me personally, my favorite combination of an animal to make a pet is the Highland Unicorn because they'll get their three natural attack dice, they'll get the charge plus two, they'll get the melee plus one for being a pet, and they'll also get an additional melee plus one after you force push your opponent into the same zone as your mage and charge in to attack with that unicorn. Absolutely a blast and so much fun. 
Now, here's equipment. You see there's bare skin and leather gloves. Um, they are quick actions because usually on the first turn, people are going to be bringing out some types of armor, some types of equipment. And these will add defenses to your mage. These are not placed on the board. Normally, the armor and equipment that your mage wears is placed off the board near you. That way, it doesn't clutter up the board. But you see, bare skin, your armor will gain, uh, your mage gains armor plus two and frost minus two, which basically means frost damage does two less to him. And this one will give the mage armor plus one. There's much deeper levels or types of equipment as well. You'll see there is a mage wand with spellbind. You may bind a non-epic incantation spell from your spellbook to the mage wand. As a quick spell, you may pay three mana to change the bound spell. So, what does that mean? If I wanted to put chain lightning in my spell book and bind it to that mage wand, instead of just playing the chain lightning and discarding it, that chain lightning is now quote unquote learned by the mage wand and I can continue to play it. There's also staves, there's rings, there's belts. And then you get into conjurations. Conjurations are a different type of card which represents something that your mage has built in the arena. So biggest thing that is an advantage for the Beastmaster is the lair. Now they're expensive, like this one's 15, but it's a spawn point. And this one will actually generate mana and you can use it to spawn creatures in addition to the creatures your Beastmaster spawns. Makes pretty much sense considering it's a Beastmaster. There's mana flowers that will allow you to increase your channeling. There are walls, like we talked about before, that can get placed in between zones. There are um, different kind of, I guess, um, creature, conjuration creatures, you could call it. Um, and then there's some like this one, Tooth and Nail, which is a zone exclusive. All animal creatures and melee attacks gain the piercing plus one trait, which you can imagine what piercing is. That's right, ignoring armors. Again, you'll see that all of these things are very logical. So the mage sits there and creates this statue of a bear head, and then all of a sudden, all of his guys have the ability to just crunch through all the armor of their opponents. Now we get into creatures. You get into Timberwolves, who cost nine mana. They have a quick cast melee attack action for four dice with two armor and 10 health. Fairly basic type of creature. Then you get into much bigger creatures. You get into those that have flying. As you can imagine, flyers attack flyers, non-flyers can't attack flyers. There's different uh, traits and different things like that that will affect the game. You have big guys like Steel Claw, Steel Claw Grizzly who cost 17 mana, but has a quick attack action for five dice that pierces one and a full action for seven dice that pierces one and he has frost minus three and he's still in the middle here of what kind of large creatures you can get to you have red claw the alpha male he's legendary and he has a five dice attack he says all other friendly canine creatures in the same zone as red claw gain armor plus one and melee plus one so again being able to summon more creatures and affect the ones that are canines in each of the areas there is just so much to being a beastmaster with creatures i can't even begin to describe it because this is just the basic starting spell book there's uh, Severe, or Severe, the Forest Shadow. He's fast, elusive, and legendary, and he does four dice attack, but he also has this trait. Now you see, normally they have armor, and then they have their health. He has eight plus one times. What that means is, if someone wants to attack him, he can roll the D12, and on an eight plus, completely defend the attack. So while there's armor in blocking the damage, there are also defense attributes which make people very, very hard to hit. Once you move on from creatures, you get into enchantments. Now enchantments are very unique because you'll notice that there is a number with a closed eye and a number with a open eye. When you normally play enchantments, they will go onto a creature or onto a zone, maybe onto a conjuration, but they will go in face down. And they will go in face down by paying this two cost. Almost everything, in fact, I think everything in the game has a face down cost of two. There are some that you'll notice like block have a red number with their eye. 
The difference is this. If it's a purple number and an eye, you control when you turn that enchantment over and when it will take effect in the game. A red one is a must. So for instance, block says, when this creature is attacked, because you're putting it onto a creature, when this creature is attacked, you must reveal block during the avoid attack step. Block counts as a defense and the attack is avoided. Then destroy block and if the attack is unavoidable, destroy block without the effect. So. That is an example of something that is a must happen. This bear strength just says this creature gains melee plus two. So I can put that on my creature, leave it face down, and he does not get that effect. But then if I want to jump in and attack somebody, boom, I can pay the three, flip it over, he's in the, t uh, the attack, and he'll get the melee plus two. This leads to a lot, and I mean a lot, of devious planning throughout the game. Because again, you could have the greatest spell book put together, it's all around timing. It's all around when you're going to play those cards. Nullify is an example you'll see again as a must. Marked for death is a may, so you can choose when to do that. You'll also see things like this that say mage bind. Um, both the marked for death and the regrowth have that. Mage bind means it's a spell that if you were to cast the enchantment on your mage, you have to pay that much additional mana because it's more impactful when it's on your mage. For example, regrowth says this creature gains the regenerate two trait. Putting that on your mage is very valuable. Two points can mean quite a bit in this game when you're talking about health. There's also uh, things like Cobra Reflexes that will give you the defense of a 7 plus, and then Bull Endurance, which gives you more health. There's things that give you fast, give you flying, all different types. Then you move into incantations, which are kind of like spells. Incantations will do different things, and they're very logical. Again, Beastmasters have things like Call of the Wild, which gives all friendly animal creatures in the arena plus one melee trait until the end of the round. That can be deadly when you have a massive amount of creatures out. Or Dispel, which destroys the target, which in this case is a revealed enchantment. So like Rhino Hide would be a revealed enchantment if it was in play. And X is the total mana cost of the target enchantment. So you'll see there's X there. You can Dissolve, which is basically like destroying an enchantment, but you're going to be dis uh, dissolving equipment. And then you can get into other things like healing, minor heals, major heals, group heals, evading, and things like that. Now, finally, you have the red cards, which are attacks. Attacks are direct spells from your mage, like we showed you Chain Lightning before it was an attack. And those are things that are either going to attack an entire zone sometimes and hit all the creatures in one zone, or attack a specific target. So there's quite a bit, and this is just the starting spell book. So once again, thank you so much for watching this. We hope you enjoy your time in the arena with Mage Wars. But until next time, let us know your thoughts. This is a game that's been in development for quite some time, and while I do enjoy it very much, I'm very curious to hear other people's experiences with it as well. So that's Mage Wars, both the critical review and a deeper look at the starting spellbook for the Beastmaster. This game is definitely a crit, and it's one that's a ton of fun. We hope you enjoy it too, but as we said before, feel free to leave your comments here on the YouTube channel below. Of course, you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Google+, and our homepage at critshappen.com. But until next time, we hope you thoroughly enjoy your time in the arena. We have, and we plan to do it again. Keep rolling those dice, and we hope they're all crits.